there's another kind of guilt that will make you give up. And so much of our dialogue these days in public spaces has to do with engaging in what Albert Camus called this algebra of blood. Because the end of the aim is not so much to see ways in which we can build on a common ground, but rather to manipulate each other because our distrust is so deep or we've given up on the possibility of forging bonds of trust that are necessary for a vibrant public life, a building of bridges, a creation of the kind of multiracial alliances and coalitions that are necessary if ordinary people's lives are ever going to be what they ought. Public conversation, the precious activity of Citizens communicating, not pontificating, not intellectually ejaculating, <laughs> but communicating with one another. Communication presupposes self-criticism. You could be wrong. But Martin Buber put it, when you leave dialogue, you ought to be a little different than when you entered. If you listened, you just let off steam, then you didn't communicate. You just made your point. John Dewey said it so well in his classic of 1927, The Public and Its Problems. So once a democracy begins to lose the art of public conversation, it slides down a slippery slope of more and more chaos and anarchy, precisely because the citizenry feels helpless, impotent, feels as if it, it, it cannot make a difference, and therefore all one can do is close ranks. Close ranks mentality. I'll unite and consolidate my group, my clan, you unite and consolidate yours. And as we up the ante in regard to paranoia, it's no accident that we're going to see more and more conspiratorial theories because a person who's paranoid believes there's only one or two people or one small group there pulling all the strings. And you get conspiracy theories across the board because of the paranoia, which makes it more and more difficult for public conversation to take place, the very kind of thing the Institute of National Affairs devoted to. And only with a sense of history, what I was saying was on America, can one begin to note the ways in which the ambiguous legacies and all of us being part of hybrid cultures can, can produce a self-critical sensibility that is so very, very necessary. I know that one is often told in an educational institution that Socrates said the unexamined life is not worth living. But Malcolm X reminds us that the examined life is painful. It takes courage to be self-critical. Remember what Malcolm X says in his autobiography, my life has been a chronology of changes because I recognize it's oftentimes not simply a courage of my convictions, but also at times a courage to attack my convictions. I could be wrong. And that's the beginnings of a serious conversation. Because you recognize that there's something worth listening to in regard to what others have to say. Even as you put a premium on highlighting hypocrisy in others, you recognize that there may in fact be hypocrisy in yourself. What it means to help constitute a public conversation. Last but not least, there's no doubt in my mind, at least, of course, I could be wrong, too. And we're living in a time in which more and more people are weary and tired. So, as I travel the country, people say, oh, Brother West, why are you talking about race again? We saw that issue in the 60s. Black people doing so well. They do is turn television on there. On from early morning until night line. So who are you talking about? Yeah, I'm talking about Ofra. Yeah, Ofra is doing well. God bless her. But 51% of black children live in dire poverty. I'm talking about Arsenio. Arsenio is doing well. God bless him. He's talented like Ofra. In their own way. But 33% of all black people live in poverty. 42% of 
Spanish-speaking young brothers and sisters live in poverty. 20% of all children in America live in dire poverty. Britain has been in economic decline for 35 years and only 4% of their children live in poverty. The economy's been on the brink of disaster for the last eight years, but only 4% of their children live in poverty. What's going on? in the richest nation in the history of the world. People are tired, weary, are often reaching the conclusion that they cannot make a difference. And it seems to me that for those of us who are fundamentally committed to a black freedom struggle that ensures that white supremacy and its legacy is beat back but recognize that one cannot morally consistently bring critique to bear on white supremacy unless we critique male supremacy and vast economic inequality and homophobic sensibility and ecological devastation that we have to be able to generate a sense of audacious hope in one another to energize and galvanize one another so we can convince each other that the world is incomplete, that history is unfinished, that the future is in fact open-ended, that what we think and what we do can make a difference. <laughs> Fundamental. If we fundamentally believe that it's always dawn, the day breaks forever, and above the eastern horizon, at this very moment, the sun is somewhere about to peak. All we need is that little crack, that window of opportunity, try to convince one another on moral principles that the condition of truth is to allow suffering to speak and that we see social misery that is changeable, transformable, unnecessary. And if we organize and mobilize, we can make a difference. If so, then we keep alive the best of the black freedom tradition. We keep alive the best of the radical democratic tradition. T.S. Eliot was right when he said, tradition is not something you inherit. If you want it, you must obtain it with great labor. You have to fight and struggle to keep the best of a tradition alive. So I say to you tonight, you in Ames, Iowa, Iowa State University, that I hope that you do, as Earth, Wind, and Fire used to sing, keep your head to the sky. As Mahalia Jackson used to sing, Keep your hands on the plow. Now, as the freedom fighters of all colors used to sing in the 1960s, keep your eyes not on each other, not on your individual interests, not on your just group interests, but keep your eyes on the prize, something bigger than you, something that you can pass on to those who come after so you can leave the world just a little bit better than you found it. So that which is bigger than you can appeal to the best in you, the better angels of your nature, and lure the best in you such that maybe through our struggles we can mushroom in such a way that social motion and momentum and maybe even new social movements like the 1890s and 1930s and 1960s where that broadened the public debate and reconstituted public action and made ordinary citizens feel they can make a difference knowing it took tremendous courage and sacrifice but feeling as if this is the only way that this experiment called American democracy could stay afloat. Because in the long run, of course, we are on the same boat, on the same turbulent sea. It's got a big leak in it. When we go up together, we go down together. We hang together or we hang separately. Thank you very much.
have um, a 15 minute question and, and answer period. And afterwards, I would like to invite everyone to the Black Cultural Center located on Welch Avenue for a reception immediately following. Thank you so very much. Please don't hesitate. Questions, queries, interrogations. <laughs> Feel free. Yes, question in the back here. Yes, question has to do with affirmative action, and uh, let's talk about a fellow citizen who now lives in Texas who tried to push through a bill when he held office uh, to cancel affirmative action. Well, first, I think it's important to look at the history of uh, affirmative action, because affirmative action itself was an attempt to break down an old boy network that had held a relative monopoly on access to good jobs and benefits. And that old boy network itself often claimed that it was regulated by meritocracy, but in retrospect, it looked as if it often resulted in, in a lot of white male mediocrity as well. Why? Because friends, connections, and so forth, usually is not the best means by which you can sustain the highest levels of meritocratic achievement, you see. Uh, and of course, when one looks at the access of certain groups to the best jobs, the best paying jobs, prestige, and so forth. Right? One saw a virtual lock on those jobs among a certain slice of white men, not the masses of white men. Right? Not the masses of white men. Masses of white men are working ordinary white men. A well-to-do elite. And affirmative action was one means among others of trying to ensure some kind of accountability so that that old boy network could at least be less, very tight, no doubt, but at least it would be, not even shattered, but at least would less, be lessened in some sense, you see. And, uh, uh, and what, one's, what we've seen since the pushing through of that particular policy in which, in the heat of battle, based on a number of compromises and so forth, it was primarily race and gender based, has been the entree of millions of women. Women have been the major beneficiary of affirmative action, and rightly so, there's more of them in terms of uh, vis a vis black and brown uh, uh, people, even including black and brown women. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, what you say, major beneficiary has been white women. Uh, disproportionately Jewish women. They tend to be more prepared coming out of a culture in which they put emphasis on the text and reading and commentary and therefore they had acquired a level of skills that allowed them to gain access once the viciously sexist barriers began to slowly wane, still partly in place, but begin to wane a bit. Uh, now, part of the problem is, is that so much of the debate on affirmative action these days tends to highlight black folk. And this is, again, one of the ironies. Well, not an irony, it's hypocrisy, actually. Uh, that is to say that when one thinks of affirmative action, especially given the way it's been talked about in the last, oh, 10 years or so, the first thing that comes to people's minds is lower standards. Lower standards. And given the history of stereotypes and stigmatizing of black people with less than, it's no accident that a discourse about affirmative action would immediately target a group that's been associated with less than, that's what white supremacist claims are all about, black people less than, less intelligent than, less beautiful than, and so forth. See? And so much of the debate has to do with a focus just on these black folks who have benefited historically less than other groups, okay? who are farthest removed from the old well-to-do white boy network First, fired, last, hired, and so forth. And so you can see how a certain kind of double standard is played out. Now, as we know, before affirmative action, black people were already stigmatized. This is part of my problem with conservatives. And they say, well, you know, we ought to do away with affirmative action because black people feel as if if they gain access to a job by means of affirmative action, they'll be stigmatized as less than. Before affirmative action, black folks were stigmatized as less than. You see? It's not just the affirmative action. 
It's pigmentation. That's the depth of a white supremacist sensibility. We have pushed some of it back. Progress has been made. I don't want to overlook that. But you got some black folk believing, you know, I'm not affirmative action about candidate at all. I'm not affirmative action beneficiary. I did it because I work hard. You say, of course you did it because you worked hard. We're talking about how you were perceived. The black women who I was talking about worked hard. They're perceived as welfare queens. My grandmother worked hard, two jobs at the same time, raised my father, ain't Lydia and Uncle Earl, but she's perceived as welfare queen. It's the perception that we're talking about, you see? And it's another way to, to unsettle black self-confidence, you see? It can feel uncomfortable again, the same way I was talking about before. Entering a larger white space, to feel as if, do I really belong? Did I get here on my own criteria? And of course, you've got you know, white alumni, for example, at Princeton, who got there on, in a number of different ways. <laughs> and they walk around like they own the place. Oh, Princeton. I, be I belong here. You see? They could be as mediocre as can be, but they just feel like they belong. And a black student, straight A, president, First violinist in the orchestra, you must be affirmative action. Uh-huh, you from Chicago. <laughs> I've mentioned Chicago because it's produced such high level black talent, but uh, 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 Mississippi really, but we can go on. But, but, the, uh, but you, see, you see, I'm going no brother on this point. So that I do believe that uh, there are some mixed results in affirmative action. It can easily be manipulated, and it can be manipulated in such a way that it reinforces black failure by black people accepting the notion that they really cannot meet high standards. And there's also a mixed relation in terms of then you get white, many white men who think that again, it's these black folk who are holding who are in my way serving as my major impediment for my access, you see? And you can see how they pit it against each other in that way. Why? Because there's a number of other factors out there that have to do with why it's difficult to gain access to those slots, you see? Why highlight this one particular factor as opposed to a whole host of other factors? Very, very important. And not only that, but I think in the end, too, and I think Ronald Dworkin's made this point with great perspicacity that uh, there is a difference between a violation of a right and the frustration of an expectation. You see, that when black people could not attend a university because it was legally segregated, that's a violation of a right, quite citizen. When you have 10,000 slots at a Harvard college, I mean, excuse me, 1,200 slots and 10,000 applications, for the 8,800 who don't get in, the variety of different criteria used to justify why they didn't get in is not a violation of their right. It is a frustration of an expectation because they are not being told that it is solely race. They are told that there's a number of factors that go in, including the fact that we like more people from Montana to go to Harvard than New York. Regional diversity is one factor, you see. International experience can be one factor. Extracurricular activity could be one factor. Cultural diversity could be one factor, among a whole host of others, you see. But that is not saying you cannot attend this institution because you are white. That's not the claim. The claim is there's a number of different criteria that we're deploying in order to justify a person gaining access or not gaining access. And here's the 1,200. 8,800 didn't make it. But what does one often see? Well, let me see what which black folk got in. Didn't let me get their SAT, pull out my SAT, 
and say I was excluded because of race. You see how narrow that is, how truncated that is. You see? Why? Because again, it's so hard to get beyond viewing black folk as more than a problem to you. As just fellow citizens who have assets like anybody else, some of whom will get into college, some of whom will not, some of whom will have 800 SAT, others of whom will have 500 and so forth and so forth. That's a long answer. I won't answer each question like that, but I appreciate you, you raising it here and in here. Conflict between uh, Minister Louis Farrakhan and the ADL, Mr. Abraham Foxman. We'd be here all night, don't we? <laughs> uh, very much so. I mean, as we know, I mean, there's a long, uh, there's a long history of uh, anti-Semitism in this country. Anti-Semitism is American as cherry pie. Uh, and it's gone hand in hand with every group of Christians that we know. Christianity itself has been one of the major bears of anti-Semitic action and behavior and so forth. Uh, and the black community, which has been deeply shaped by Christianity, has in a fascinating kind of way been less affected by anti-Semitism than most other Christians in American society, but the black community still has it's xenophobes when it comes to anti-Jewish racism. Uh, now, part of that reason has to do with the fact that there's been a number of black freedom fighters who've been preoccupied with the Jewish freedom struggle, the struggle for Jewish national self-determination. Darby, of course, called himself a Zionist, right? Precisely because he viewed himself as parallel with Theodore Herzl. Garvey wanted a nation in Africa, Herschel wanted one first in, in, in Central America and later in the Middle East. Why? Because both people were degraded others. <coughs> Profound hatred of Jews that sits at the very center of medieval and modern Europe. And a deep hatred of black people sat at the very center of American civilization. They're both degraded others. And they're both peoples who had tremendous difficulty gaining protection from their nation states. Now, what we get then in certain black nationalist movements is a preoccupation with those who have been cast as degraded others, in this case Jews, and trying to discern how it is that they seem to have, in some significant sense, gotten from under. So you get a lot of myths about Jewish unity, Jewish homogeneity, because they were able to achieve. If we could have just the same unity, the same homogeneity, then we might be able to get out this social misery, this hell that we're catching. Uh, uh, in addition to that, though, yeah, I think you also uh, have uh, the kind of uh, distrust and paranoia that I was talking about, the degree to which in the last 15 years so much of the black social misery has been rendered invisible. And therefore, there are bold and defiant critics coming out of black nationalist movements who are trying to target particular <laughs> sources of power that are linked to black social misery. And you see more and more uh, within uh, uh, the Nation of Islam, which is one expression of black nationalism, the whole host of different expressions, this has a lot of different expressions of black Islamic practices, orthodox black Muslims who are different from the nation and so forth and so on. But there's a preoccupation with Jewish power linked to black misery. Begin with black misery, rightly so. Black misery is real. We've been talking about it. And if we can just trace it too, a certain set of causes, and in much of the rhetoric in the last, oh, six or seven years, we've more and more seen that link between black uh, social misery and Jewish power. Uh, now, I think it's important to note, of course, that uh, there's no doubt that Jews in America have engaged in astonishing entree into the middle classes, most of middle dogs and upper middle dogs and some top dogs in American society. Yet they have underdog mentalities because one out of three were killed in the 30s and 40s, because they have a history of such threats, of annihilation and so forth, you see. And therefore, the problem becomes, how does one talk honestly about power held by different groups without it being cast in conspiratorial terms or without one highlighting their ethnicity as opposed to their elite status. Because in fact, they tend to behave much more as elites than they would as members of a particular ethnic group. 
And one sees that, not just through the history of humankind, but one sees that in the United States as well. You get black elites, they tend to more and more drift with elites than they do with ordinary folk who struggle. You get brown elites, it's the same way. Why? Because elites in general become part of a subculture. It has to do with how they can reproduce themselves and so forth, you see. So that when you look at Jewish elites, those who are looking at their Jewishness primarily are missing most of what is significant about them. You should be looking at their elite status because that's what holds them together with vis-a-vis -vis other elites. Same is true when we talk about the slave trade. You see, slave trade was one of the most lucrative businesses in the modern world and merchants from all around the world tried to get in on it, didn't they? African elites did, Arab elites did, European elites did, Jewish elites did. All the elites tried to get in on it. It's almost like if somebody came up to us right now, you know, and said, look, they got a lotto, and we got one out of two chances. <laughs> All these different colors and different orientations and so forth, more than likely, I'd say a prayer first, <laughs> would take a chance. Would take a chance. But then people look at the slave trade with all of these precious African bodies being so, well, let's just keep track of this slice of this elite. And this other slice, they were all in on it, making money on these bodies. And the same when you look at corporate America, elites across the board, different colors, in on trying to gain access to huge revenues and high levels of prosperity, right, and so forth and so on, you see. So that I, uh, I think it's very important to view this within this longer, larger context so that it facilitates the possibility of progressives rising above any set of xenophobic sensibilities so that they can work together vis-a-vis -vis elites. And that's going to be very difficult because it made a drift of the times. It's away from that. We live in a moment of xenophobic frenzy and closed ranks mentality, so you have to very much fight against the grain. But I think that's the only way ordinary people are going to be empowered. Yes, question. I wonder, I assume. Then we'll, we'll jump back over there. Yeah. I assume you'd agree with, with Barlett and Steele, who wrote this book, Born in America, mm -hmm. and attribute this change in the diamond to the hourglass shape of the economy to a couple of administrations and their political policies. I wonder if you believe that a couple more administrations' political policies could reverse Could, could turn it around. Yeah, people hear that in the back. Uh, the question had to do was uh, whether, in fact, I would claim that much of the reshaping, reshaping of American social structure from diamond to hourglass has to do with the sets of policies of two administrations. And see, I would argue that it goes far beyond that. It's far beyond that. The most regressive taxation bill since 1920 was enacted in 1978 by the Carter administration. That the process of deindustrialization which is a global process, it was always already at work by the 80s. That is to say, it had already been set in place in the 50s, picked up in the 60s and 70s. Industrial flight began to intensify and so on. Uh, and so, I mean, you look in the black community, the, the level of uh, depression ravaging black community. In 1960, 40% of young black men between 16 and 21 had decent paying industrial jobs. Today, it's 7%. So that's a level of unemployment and underemployment that tilts toward the invasion of market forces in the black community, primarily buying and selling of drugs, that serves as one of the means by which one gains access to revenues, because the industrial job's no longer there. That's the, I think the, the policies of the, uh, the Reagan and Bush administrations reinforce much of the worst of these larger processes. But these larger processes were already going on. I think the major policy that reinforced the worst was the policies of deregulation. Because what you got was it made it very difficult and not impossible for working people to come together and organize and protect themselves vis-a-vis -vis the power of management at the workplace. That's the only way you can have corporate executives whose salaries increase 225%. Workers weren't dumb. They, weren't, they knew what was going on. They couldn't come together. They couldn't organize to fight it. You see, and they couldn't make it a public issue to debate it. You see. In addition, you also had the, uh, 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 well, you know, and, and, uh, we're here in Iowa, you know, in agribusiness, and the marginalization of small f farmers and so forth, again, unable to, to deal with the power of bank and agribusiness 
as it was unified and consolidated and so forth. And so deregulating policy, the policy of deregulation tended to reinforce the worst of the devastating impacts of deindustrialization. Can it be turned around? I think it can be turned around, but it can only be turned around by not just looking for political elites like a, a President Bill Clinton, who talks about stimulus and investment, but is yet to fundamentally fight for it, but it will be turned around when there are more progressive elites who recognize that they must link with organizing and mobilizing among everyday working people. And it's precisely that linkage that could create the kind of both atmosphere and context where policies and programs flow. Because it's, I think it's important to keep in mind it's not primarily just a matter of policy and programs. It's a matter of priorities and vision. Policy and programs are predicated on priorities. Priorities are couched in visions. As long as the debate is only at the level of policy and program, it's more than likely going to be a very little narrow, truncated debate between some liberal and some conservative. Sharing 80% of the basic assumptions and presuppositions of the definition of the problem. Which makes us feel as if we're in lockdown. You see, we got to get beyond this little narrow debate. Because a different vision and highlighting different kind of priorities pull the rug from under the basic assumptions that we often see between the new Democrats and the old Republicans, or the old Democrats and the new Republicans, and so forth and so on. You see. And that's very difficult to do in this nation, but it tends to happen about every 30 years, I mentioned before. So it's about time, actually. It's about time. Question in the back, and then we got a question in the back here. Uh, here and here. Yes. question though. Uh, tell me if this is a fair characterization of your very difficult and complex question. Uh, what is the relation between, on the one hand, the visibility of gangster rappers and the various critiques of gangster rappers and the gangsterization at one season of larger society, including corporate America? And what role does, I mean, we can talk about hip hop in relation to the targeting of gangster rappers. But we can also talk about the way in which misogyny and patriarchal sensibility operates in corporate boardrooms and in very high places, you see. OK, that's a tough one. <laughs> that's a tough one. Uh, but first, let me make my claim about hip hop culture, which I think is one of the most fascinating innovations in popular culture uh, that fuses uh, black linguistic virtuosity with high tech technology to actually seize a, a certain uh, portion of the marketplace that has thoroughly you know, socialized and acculturated young people these days across race. Uh, I think it, it, it began as an effort of young people to socialize and acculturate themselves as they perceive the institutions like family and church and synagogue no longer in place to socialize them. So they had to, he had to put forward a certain kind of information, a certain kind of vision, certain kind of political orientation. And of course, as you can imagine, it deeply defined the experience of a younger generation over against older, older brothers like myself. Because I'm a Motown Gamble Huff brother. <laughs> so, and, but it's no doubt that for young brothers, they come out of the hip hop culture. That's a distinctive feature of their generational experience. And that's also true for white brothers and sisters, brown brothers and sisters, yellow brothers and sisters, across the board, because hip hop, of course, is a national and international phenomenon. Now, there's no doubt that, as one could imagine, young people socializing themselves and acculturating themselves, uh, that there's going to be some problems. There's always enough problems with older people socializing young people. Right? And it will both reproduce some of the best and some of the worst of American society. And some of the worst of American society is misogyny and homophobia. And one sees this cycle over and over again 
in a whole host of various gangster rappers. Uh, one also sees in uh, the products of a number of gangster rappers or a critique of white supremacy that's very important. And a spirit of resistance that is very important. And so one has to engage in a dialectical reading of Ice T or Ice Cube, for example. See, that the critique of white supremacy is serious. And that's more than what most spoke persons in American society put for. The degradation of women, degradation of gay brothers and lesbian sisters is wrong anymore. You see. So when you hear him talking about fags, you say, are you talking about James Baldwin? Make it clear to me. James Baldwin gave his life for black folk. Is that what you have in mind? You're just gonna call him a name like that? Are you talking about Audrey Lord? She gave a life for black folk. You gonna call her that name? Well, no, we didn't have her. We had the, the brother who plays organ in church in mind. <laughs> the brother who plays organ in church makes a fundamental contribution to the spiritual life of those black folk who show up every Sunday. Why lose sight of his humanity? But it's, it's a critique in the spirit of them being able to change. Because I do believe that, uh, that, 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 that young folk, including gangster rappers, are in process, that they can be changed. Uh, I think what often happens, though, and again, this is part of the legacy of white supremacy, you get the double standards. That is to say, you get gangster rappers viewed as if they have a monopoly on misogyny in American society. Whereas we know misogyny itself is you know, runs the gamut throughout the society, you see. Uh, uh, and one must always preclude any use of double standards when it comes to an evaluation of black folk. This is also true even back again to in relation to Minister Louis Farrakhan. You see. That part of the problem becomes if Pat Buchanan is hardly noticed given his long history of vicious anti-Semitic remarks, but Minister Farrakhan makes one remark and he's on the front cover of every major newspaper across the country, then you say, wait a minute, we got double standards here. Yes, black folk might have their xenophobe. Of course we, so we have folk who say things that ought not be said. Like, what's his brother, colleague, Abdul Muhammad? He gave a speech the other day. It's unadulterated bigotry. I hear unadulterated bigotry at the barbershop. I dialogue with the brothers, tell them it's wrong. Just tell them it's wrong. I ought not be saying that. That's foolish. That's sick, man. Think about it. You don't put them on the front page and demonize them and vilify them and isolate them so you can't even relate to them no more. You're not really interested in changing the situation if all you're going to do is just demonize somebody. You see? You got to be able to move, folks. You see? You got to be able to move, folks. That's very important. Very important. I mean, if we reach the point where we begin to demonize every person who engages in some kind of xenophobic language, most of Congress would have to go. <laughs> I mean, look at this brother Holland, Senator Holland. I mean, you got James Baker saying, F-U-C-K the kind of Jews in the cabinet meeting. He's got power. He's part of negotiation with Israel, allegedly, right? And you say, well, Mr. Baker, I know you kind of went, went far on that. Uh, <laughs> come on, man. <laughs> and that's often what other white folk do to other white folk. Oh, come on, Jim, you went too far using that hyperbolic language. Come on, on Jim. <laughs> you don't put James Baker on the front page. New xenophobe for the world to see. Major exemplar of anti-Semitism. Because that pushes him against the wall. It brings out the worst in him. Then he comes out fighting. That's what happened with Minister Louis Farrakhan. You see? He says Hitler is wickedly great. Then he compares him to Alexander the Great. He says, why do you call Alexander the Great? The man was killing folk. Next thing you know, he's, he's Hitler. Then about two weeks later, he says, Judaism is a gutter religion. 
strong. That's immoral. But he already said Hitler was great. Well, wait a minute. He said he, he was wickedly great. He's not a Nazi. He said, that, that's Semite. That's something else. That's something else. Anti-Semite believes in conspiratorial theories that link Jewish power to certain kind of misery. A Nazi believes that Jews ought to be killed. A patriarchal brother believes that women can be treated in a degraded way. A misogynist believes that women can be viciously and violently attacked. There's a difference. There's many patriarchy folk, patriarchal folk around, wrong as they are, who believe rape is thoroughly immoral and will not participate in it. We have to make distinctions. A misogynist will run around thinking rape is an act of conquest. That's a difference. Neither one's a compliment. <laughs> but it's a very important difference. I, I'm, I'm sorry to go on and on on this, but you, you see where I'm going with this in terms of how, in fact, the double standards pollutes the public conversation to such a degree that we find it difficult to communicate. You see. And we have this debate also in the black community because you know, we need public conversation within the black community. And for me, there's no doubt in my mind that in a public conversation in the black community, spokesperson for the Nation of Islam will be there. And they will be there primarily because they have a significant influence on the minds, especially of young black brothers and sisters. And for those of us who want to fight for those minds, we're not going to trump conversation or foreclose any dialogue whatsoever because we believe they can be changed. Malcolm X, good example. Good example. But the dialogue that will take place will be a highly contentious one. Because black freedom fighters in the name of Fannie Lou Hamer are not putting up with any form of xenophobia whatsoever. But that includes against black women, black working people, against black gays, black lesbians, black disadvantaged. Right across the board. I'm sorry, going. I got a question in the back. Now I got you got both of you at the same time. Uh, we 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 here and then we're going we, we're going right next to you. Right. I have a question. Yeah. Uh, my question is, uh, we welcome to Iowa State University. Thank you, ladies. And uh, the most important thing I would like to tell us is the message you would like us to do as students and scholars in this institution. How do we resolve all those things? that question though, brother. I know you must be from Sudan. Uh, uh, good question. Uh, uh, thank, thanks so much, Dr. Um Well, first let me say something quickly in general, and then I'll focus on uh, Iowa State University based on my wholesale ignorance of the institution, right? Uh, 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 but first, it's important to keep in mind that an unorganized freedom fighter is a contradiction in terms. 
you must be with a network with some group of people, with some organization that's fighting for something bigger than you. It's not just a matter of having the right vision in your, in your head and the right argument in your brain and not being organized, sharing it with others. Very, very important. The second thing is then what forms of organizing can take place here to ensure the free flow of conversation necessary so that one, there are the crucial supportive networks in place for students who come to a place that often feel as if it is a place where there's relative alienation and frustration that can reinforce a certain lack of confidence. And the only way you do that is in serious, candid, critical conversation with leadership of this institution to say how together can we ensure that whatever it is, retention rates and the quality of life, quality of conversation is one that is